Hi, welcome to a lecture on antenna systems with high directivity. We begin by noting that common antennas, such as dipoles and patches, uh, yield directivity which is relatively small, typically less than about uh, 8 dBi or so. And uh, correspondingly, beam widths which are relatively large, about 60 degrees or so. That is, they spray energy on transmit over wide angular spans. So this isn't always uh, suitable for every application. In fact, often one wishes directivity to be much, much greater than 10 dBi, perhaps as much as 30 or 40 or 50 or 60 dBi. And that would be desired for range extension, right? The directivity is talking about the power density in a particular direction, and um, the more power you can focus in the desired direction, the longer the range of the link uh, that you're trying to establish or maintain uh, can be. Similarly, uh, many applications call for beam widths which are very, very narrow, less than or much less than 10 degrees or so. Uh, sometimes we refer to that as spatial selectivity. In other words, the ability to send energy very preferentially in one direction and very little of the energy in any other direction. So, you can ask the question, how can we achieve this? How can we obtain antennas that have high directivity? Rather than jumping to one obvious answer, which is uh, a large array, let's just think about some of the possibilities so we see what the trade-offs are. First, collimation. Collimation is focusing, and the best example I can think of of collimation is a dish-type reflector. You have a low-gain uh, antenna, uh, a dipole, a patch, uh, perhaps some other thing. As a feed, you put it at the focus of the reflector and thereby turn a spherical wave incident on the reflector into a plane wave which propagates away from the reflector. In other words, parabolic reflectors are things which convert spherical waves from a low-gain feed into plane waves and thereby achieve directivity. You see directivity is going to be very high here because the power is going very strongly uh, from left to right here uh, after it reflects from the reflector. Very little of the power would go in any other direction, and that would have to be due to diffraction from the dish edges, for example. So, problem solved. Um, a large uh, directivity can be achieved using collimation, like in a dish reflector. Of course, there are issues. One is size and weight. Uh, a large reflector is heavy, and it takes up a lot of space. And secondarily, if you want to move the beam around, then that requires mechanical steering. This whole assembly has to be able to rotate. Now, there are some, some modifications to that. For example, you can achieve limited steering using a thing called a focal plane array. In a focal plane array system, you replace that single feed with an array, which can um, result in a limited amount of, of beam steering. But that's a, uh, that's a limited strategy. It doesn't really apply to all practical problems. That brings us to end fire arrays. In an end fire array, you arrange the elements in a line and the maximum directivity is then in the same line. So here I'm showing those elements as being dipole-like things. Here are the dipoles. And I'll put them one wavelength apart. And when I put them one wavelength apart, that means the electrical distance between each element is going to be two pi radians or 360 degrees which means that the radiation from one element to the next will be in phase with the radiation from that element, and in turn in a phase with the radiation from uh, a third element, and so on. So you will achieve a very high gain depending on how many elements you have arranged in this manner. The problem with this scheme, of course, is that you get high directivity in other directions as well. Just as you get a wave which goes in this direction with high power density, you also get a wave which goes to the left with high power density because the same geometry applies. They all add up in phase for a wave which is traveling to the left. And then, of course, since I've chosen all of the sources to be in phase, as indicated by the plus signs here, that means I can also have a broadside beam, a beam that goes up and a beam that goes down. So instead of just having that one main lobe, I have three other main lobes. 
in addition to possibly some side lobes. Now there are of course corrections to some of these things. For example, what you can do is reduce the spacing between elements to be lambda by two, as I've shown here, and then change the phase of every other source by 180 degrees. So this is the same combination of elements with half the spacing and then alternating the phase of the excitation of the sources. In this scheme, you still get the desired beam and you unfortunately also get this back lobe uh, as we refer to it because the same thing happens in both directions. But you kill off the beam which would have been formed broadside, right? Because every one of these elements is out of phase with respect to uh, another element uh, which is radiating the same direction. So this is an improvement, not a complete solution, but it's, it's somewhat better. And I'll tell you, you can chase this uh, down a long rabbit hole, and uh, eventually you'll get to a thing called a, a yagi. And a yagi uh, is an arrangement of these elements in which you manipulate these relationships in addition to electromagnetic coupling between the elements in such a way that you get the desired result, which is a single lobe with high directivity. And uh, yagis are an important class of antennas to be sure, but there are issues to consider. One is, once again, the size, in this case, the length. Yagis with high directivity, uh, and fire arrays in general with high directivity, uh, require uh, lots of elements, and uh, so you have a very long uh, structure. And if you want the directivity to be competitive with something which does collimation, like a reflector, well, that's gonna be a lot of elements. So typically, a Yagi, you see those having directivities of between 10 dB, 20 dB, maybe 25 dB to 30 dB in some limited cases. But getting to 40 or 50 dB with a, um, a Yagi is a very difficult thing. And then, of course, like a collimator, the issue is you have to do mechanical steering. You actually have to physically move the whole antenna to move the beam. This brings us to the Uniform Linear Array. And the distinction in what I'm calling the Uniform Linear Array here, or the ULA, is that the desired lobe is now broadside to the elements. So the elements I've arranged here to be collinear, and their excitations are in phase, and that results in a broadside beam, because all these elements add in phase in this direction, their phase fronts line up, and uh, so I get a very strong lobe in one direction. Of course, I also get that lobe in the uh, other direction, right? There's nothing to stop a beam forming to the uh, left. I'll come back to that in a moment, though. Here, the spacing between elements, D, is not obvious to start off with. In a, in a broadside array such as this, uh, we clearly have some flexibility in what the spacing between the elements uh, can be. But I will tell you that it needs to be about half a wavelength or so to avoid a lobe in the perpendicular directions. And what I mean by that is uh, if you have this half wavelength spacing from here to here, then that will kill off a beam which forms either up or down as shown in this geometry, right? If this distance d is uh, too far away from lambda by 2, then you will certainly have something start to try to form in those directions. So lambda by 2 is the sweet spot, although there are some reasons why we might want to modify that. We'll come back to those either in this lecture or in future lectures. Clearly, if that spacing between elements is too small, the directivity is uh, reduced. For example, if it goes to zero, all those elements are just piled on top of each other, and there is no increase in directivity. In other words, no matter how many dipoles you pile on top of each other, one, two, three, four, five, six, and so on, um, you end up with something that radiates as if it's one dipole in terms of its directivity, right? You can increase the amount of power being radiated, but the directivity is not being increased because the average power is also going up. So clearly letting the spacing between elements go to zero or get too small is bad because it reduces directivity. Similarly, letting the spacing go too close to uh, one wavelength is bad because then you create those end fire lobes as I just alluded to. So that lambda by two spacing gives us the best possible case in this particular geometry, but now we have that um, issue of the second lobe and how now might we get rid of that.
So here are some ways that you might consider getting rid of that back lobe. One is to use directional elements. In other words, instead of using something like a dipole, perhaps you use something like a horn. A horn is somewhat directive, order 6 to 12, 15 dB or so. A relatively small back lobe. So if you arrange the elements uh, as I've described it previously for the dipole, but used horns instead, then you would have something which is very strongly directional in one direction and less directional in the back lobe. So that's one way to do it. Another way to do it is with a ground plane. And the idea here is that you add this ground plane behind the dipole-like radiators, and you do that with a separation of one quarter wavelength, or 90 degrees if you want to think of it that way. So the idea here is that radiation going directly away from the ground plane is not really affected by the ground plane, and so you form the lobe that you uh, are seeking. But the radiation which heads from the element towards the ground plane experiences the following phase shifts. There is a pi over 2 phase shift associated with that lambda by 4 distance. There's a pi over 2 phase shift for the trip back from the ground plane. Again do that lambda by 4 distance, and then you have a pi phase shift, 180 degree phase shift, due to reflection from the ground plane. Electromagnetics folks uh, may recall or should recall that the boundary condition on a ground plane that's conducting is that the tangential component of the electric field is equal to zero. So that forces the reflected field to be 180 degrees out of phase with the incident field on the ground plane. So we add this up, pi over 2 in this direction, pi due to reflection from the ground plane, pi over 2 for the trip back, and lo and behold, we end up with 2 pi of phase for the returning wave from the ground plane, which is in phase with the desired lobe. So this results in a very, very small back lobe. The only way power can get around the ground plane is by diffracting around the edges, and that's a very weak mechanism in most cases. So, this geometry turns out to be very important in large array design. It is uh, a primary tool for getting rid of that undesired back lobe. Now, let's talk about beam steering for a ULA. Previously, we just assumed a broadside beam, but now we ask the question, how might we steer this beam around? Because remember, we're trying to avoid the disadvantage of the collimators and of the end-fire arrays and that they have to be mechanically steered. So now, how do we do beam steering? Well, the idea is really quite simple. In the far field, you want a plane of constant phase. And to achieve that, you simply work out the geometry here. I might excite this source with a phase of zero, I have to excite this source with a different phase, such that propagation to that same plane gives me zero phase. Similarly, I have to modify the phase of that source, such that propagation to the plane gives me again zero phase, equal to the reference, and so on. So, in order to form this beam that results from this plane of constant phase, and the beam looks like this in this picture, I need to apply a set of phase shifts, which in this picture goes 0 plus delta psi plus 2 delta psi plus 3 delta psi. That's assuming these elements are uniformly spaced. Uh, for that reason, we frequently call this kind of scheme a progressive phase shift, progressive referring to the fact that uh, the phases are multiples uh, of each other. Um, again, that is when you have uniformly spaced uh, elements. So this is a way that you can do beam steering by simply changing the phases of the elements. Uh, I'll make one note here. I will not show this. But the uh, main lobe is narrowest when pointed broadside. It is going to be widest to end fire. In other words, when I point the beam in this direction, I'm going to get a relatively narrow beam. And when I try to point the beam in this direction, which is essentially end fire, I'm going to get a pretty wide beam. And that will be one of the issues that you have to deal with when you design beams that are to be generated by uh, uniform linear arrays or by things which are derived from uh, this kind of geometry. Another category of arrays I refer to as uh, two-dimensional arrays, 2D arrays. Now, to be clear, later on we're going to talk about surface arrays, and uh, that's not what I mean here. 
So two canonical examples of such arrays are the uniform circular array, in which you take those elements and you arrange them in a circle like so, and the Y-shaped array, I'm not aware that that has a three-letter acronym, but uh, the Y-shaped array, where you do a similar thing, just in a different uh, geometry. So in these two arrays, the advantage is that you get approximately uniform lobe width. The lobes that are formed when you do beam forming with such a thing have about the same shape no matter which direction you point them. Now there's a slight variation in these things. For example, for the Y-shaped array, the lobe pointing in that direction, a little bit different from the beam that you get from pointing in this direction. But generally, it's approximately uniform lobe width. So these are geometries that you might consider if it's important to have uniform lobe width as you scan the beam around in different directions. Next, uh, surface arrays. Surface arrays tend to be a popular compromise. Uh, they're popular because they represent a compromise between size, uh, form factor, a scan range, um, in other words, the range of angles over which you can form a beam and over which the beam would be approximately um, the same uh, beam width, and uh, element count, that is directivity. So a lot of the arrays that especially are emerging these days are surface arrays because they represent a compromise here. Uh, the surface array is planar, as we say, or, or flat. Uh, could also be conformal. In other words, it's not necessarily the case that such arrays would always be a, uh, a completely flat surface. They might be rounded somehow to fit the surface that they are mounted on, right? The side of a vehicle, for example. Here, the array is shown as being rectangular in outline, but of course, that outline could also be circular or elliptical, right? So this doesn't have to be this shape. This could be a potato chip, for example. There is advantages and disadvantages and good reasons for changing that shape, all of which are addressed in later lectures. Here I'm showing rectilinear spacing. What rectilinear spacing means is that all the elements fall on a grid consisting of parallel columns and parallel rows. That's what it means to be rectilinear. Also shown here is uniform spacing, which means not only is the grid rectilinear, but also that the spacing between rows and columns is equal. To be clear, other patterns are possible. It doesn't necessarily have to be uh, rectilinear. There's all kinds of reasons why you might consider other geometries, including purely random geometries, where those spacings aren't at all regular. And non-uniform spacing. There's good reasons to consider the spacings where uh, all those rows and columns are not equally spaced. And then, of course, there are other possibilities that I have not yet addressed here, but which you should have in the back of your mind. For example, volumetric arrays. There's no reason why all the elements have to be piled up along a line, or in a plane, or on a surface. There are a class of arrays where the elements are distributed throughout a volume of space. Now, those aren't common because that's not a particularly convenient form factor in which to implement a practical array, but there are applications for such a thing. There are heterogeneous geometries or hybrid geometries that consist of combinations of the things I just showed. So for example, maybe you have a uniform linear array consisting of surface arrays. That's a, that is a totally plausible and um, not necessarily common approach, but it is a uh, reasonable strategy for some applications. Distributed arrays. There's really no reason why you could not consider also arrays where the elements are far apart, many wavelengths apart. Now, there's a whole bunch of baggage that goes along with doing that. Nevertheless, it is an emerging field of study, especially these days, to consider what you might do with array elements that end up being far apart and then try to somehow synthesize those into an array. That completes this lecture on high directivity antenna systems.